Dear colleagues, welcome to our third cardiovascular uh, masterclass. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this uh, great session focusing on SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, we, I would uh, love to uh, thank again uh, Johannes Betuchnik, who organized this first module focusing on heart failure um, after the first session with uh, Professor Zanat and the second session with Professor Kieland. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the third lecture by Professor McMurray. Uh, Johannes, would you like to introduce our uh, excellent guest? So, um, warm welcome from my side again. Um, Professor McMurray asked me to keep the introduction very short, so I will follow his advice. So, he's a professor of medical cardiology and deputy director of the Institute of Cardiovascular and Medical Sciences at the University of Glasgow. Um, an honorary consult cardiologist at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital of Glasgow. He was the inaugural Eugene Brownwood Scholar in Cardiovascular Disease at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, recently, George. professor of Harvard Medicine. <laughs> <laughs> and putting everything aside, um, for me, it's just very important that talking with colleagues and, and peers at his research interest to in institute, um, he really takes the time. He makes research better and uh, improves us. And um, really, um, thank you very much for taking the time and we're looking forward to your lecture. Absolutely, you know, this is it's such a great opportunity for us because we discuss the results on all conferences and we uh, read a lot about it, but really talking about trial designs and what you learned about it and what, would, what you would recommend for future trials is a great goal for all of us. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to your talk. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I hope I don't disappoint you. <laughs> which is always a risk. So I'm going to put my slides into full screen mode. So I realize that <clears throat> we have quite a mixed audience and that you don't want just a standard talk about the results of trials. So what I thought I would do is talk about some of the things that we've um, thought about when we looked at the results of the SGLT2 inhibitor trials um, and comparison of trials and looking forward to future trials. So uh, let's see if I, oh. So I'm gonna start off by doing a sort of deep dive uh, comparison of DAPHF and Emperor Reduced because I think there are some really fascinating uh, aspects of the difference between these two trials and some and and I think the message at the end of the day might be sometimes we can perhaps try and be too clever when we design our trials and I'll explain what I mean by that as I go through this. So just to remind you these were obviously two trials with an SGLT2 inhibitor one with dapagliflozin, one with empagliflozin, but they had quite different inclusion criteria and two of the key inclusion criteria are shown in this slide, inclusion criteria according to ejection fraction and natriuretic peptide measurements. So when it came to DAPHF, it was fairly straightforward. Patients had to have an ejection fraction of 40% or less, and they had to have an elevated natriuretic peptide level, and that degree of ele elevation had to be a bit greater in patients with atrial fibrillation. We also factored in whether or not people had recently been in hospital with worsening heart failure. And below you can see the criteria that were used in Emperor Reduced. Now they were as you can see, a bit more complex. And basically you either had to have a very low ejection fraction and a modest elevation in natriuretic peptides, or if your ejection fraction was above 30%, then you had, had to have uh, really quite large elevations in natriuretic peptide levels. Uh, why was this? Why did the emperor reduced investigators adopt a slightly different approach. And uh, one of the reasons was that they uh, had decided to conduct a smaller study. Uh, they were also um, keen, therefore, to have a higher event rate. 
And one way, of course, to elevate event rates is to require patients to have high natural peptide levels to have low ejection fractions. They, there were some other differences that are important, and one of those was in relation to glomerular filtration rate. The emperor reduced investigators, I think, were very clever and decided to include patients with an EGFR as low as 20 mils per minute, which really was unprecedented at the time for any heart failure trial to include patients with such a low EGFR. And that becomes relevant because in both trials, of course, we had renal endpoints as well as cardiovascular endpoints. And uh, the kidney function that you start with, the level of kidney function is very important in determining the rate with which renal endpoints will occur. So these are the key baseline characteristics in the two trials. You can see that they were very typical of HEF-REF trials. Patients were in their mid to late 60s, and uh, the majority of patients were male because HEF-REF seems to be a male disease. You can see, as would be expected by the protocol mandated inclusion criteria, people in emperor reduced had a somewhat lower average ejection fraction. And in fact, a four point difference is a very large difference. And patients in emperor reduced again, according to the protocol, had a much higher natural peptide level. There are some anomalies here that are always interesting to look at. So you might have expected with a lower ejection fraction and higher natural peptide levels that more patients in emperor reduced would have more severe symptoms, would have worse NYHA functional classification, but we didn't see that. And there are probably two reasons for that. One is that um, objective measures of severity don't necessarily correlate with symptoms in heart failure, although there is a sort of general uh, correlation or association. But also NYHA class, um, is very investigator determined and we see really striking differences in the way that investigators characterize patients by NYHA class in different parts of the world. And for example, in the former Eastern European countries, you will typically see patients who otherwise look the same as patients in Western Europe and North America who are, uh, when very similar looking patients in Western Europe and the US and Canada will actually be uh, described as NYHA class two. So NYHA class is, is a rather curious uh, characteristic in clinical trials. You can see that the emperor reduced trial had a few more patients with diabetes. Again, as you would expect from the uh, inclusion criteria had a lower average EGFR, 62 versus 66 mils per minute. Again, a four mil per minute difference is quite a large difference. Uh, so the inclusion criteria really made some uh, import, uh, resulted in some important differences in the baseline characteristics. So as you can see, I'm going through the way that I, I look at trials and compare trials and try and understand trials. And of course, one of the next things that you always look at very carefully is follow up. And the first thing you can see here from these consort diagrams, which sadly are often placed in the supplement to papers, is that the median follow up in the two trials uh, was rather short, 18 months in DAPHF and 16 months in Emperor uh, Reduced. Now, the interesting thing here is that you will see that Emperor Reduced was a substantially smaller study. It was about a thousand patients smaller, 3,730 patients fewer compared to 4,744 patients in DAPHF. So despite being a smaller trial, and these were both endpoint driven trials, 
um, the median follow-up in emperor reduced was shorter than in DAP AGF. That immediately tells you that those inclusion criteria that were required, higher natriuretic peptide levels and lower ejection fractions resulted in a more rapid accrual of events. And we'll come back to that later. And then um, the other thing, of course, I would always look at is the rate of discontinuation of randomized therapy. And here there is a surprising, and to my mind, unexplained difference between the two trials. There was a much larger, a higher rate of study drug discontinuation in emperor reduced compared to DAPAHF. And again, we'll come back to why this might be relevant later on. Uh, once again, this is often very different in different regions of the world. So where you do your trials, the countries that you include uh, can be very important when it comes to adherence to therapy. And then the last thing to look at is um, the vital status at the end of the trial. Uh, the, the number of patients where vital status is unknown is particularly important. And again, there is um, quite a difference between the two trials. In DAPHF, there were only two patients with unknown vital status at the end of the study. In Emperor reduced, there were 21. Or you might think, well, why does this matter? Well, this matters to regulators a lot. And in fact, there are prominent examples of uh, medicinal products that have not been approved because of substantial unknown vital stasis. And one of the reasons why that matters is that some of you may have heard of the concept of a sort of tipping point analysis, whereby, for example, uh, a regulator might assume that all 10 patients in the placebo group with unknown vital status are alive, and that all 11 patients with unknown vital status in the empagliflozin group are dead. And if they then reanalyze the data using those assumptions, you may see, for example, loss of a significant clinical benefit. So unknown vital status, very important, if there are a lot of patients with unknown vital status, it can really harm uh, the uh, integrity of the trial and the regulatory uh, perspective on a trial. So here are the overall results. And I suppose the headline result is that if we look at the composite of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, this was in fact the primary endpoint in Emperor Reduced. It was the first secondary endpoint in DAPHF, you can see that if you look at the hazard ratio, that the two trials really showed a remarkably similar result. 25% relative risk reduction, highly statistically significant in the two trials. Our primary endpoint in DAPHF was a composite of cardiovascular death or a worsening heart failure event reflecting a sort of evolution in composite endpoints in heart failure trials, because we are repeatedly told by colleagues around the world that there are many attempts now being made to treat worsening heart failure in the community or in hospital settings that don't involve a formal admission to a ward. And, uh, that is why that we included a broader composite, which was cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, or a worsening heart failure event that required intravenous therapy, but did not lead to hospital admission. Now, in fact, there were actually relatively few of those as additional first events. And in fact, the hazard ratio for our primary endpoint using that expanded composite out outcome was uh, 0.74. So you can see the, the rest of the outcomes here, and we'll come back to those. Now, it's interesting. What is also uh, fascinating if you do clinical trials is to see that they become a bit of a propaganda war. Uh, 
and that sponsors uh, often start to try and um, present the results of trials in a way that they think is favorable, particularly if there's a comparator trial around. And I was struck by this graphic that came out uh, within about two minutes of the presentation of Emperor Reduced. And uh, as you can see here, one of the interesting sort of differences that there, there seems to be between the two trials, according to this graphic, is that there is this substantial reduction in total heart failure hospitalizations, which is something that we had not actually designated as an endpoint in DAPHF. And in fact, we had, like many trials today in heart failure do, said that we would look at total events. So um, not just time to first events again. If you don't understand that the difference between that, think of a patient with heart failure who might be admitted to hospital, uh, get better, get discharged, go home, be readmitted to hospital with worsening heart failure three months later, again, recover, get discharged, and then sadly, perhaps die suddenly uh, six months after that. So that patient's had three events in our traditional time to first event analysis, which is generally what you see when you see clinical trials presented. The, the event that counts in that patient is heart failure hospitalization. That was the first event. But of course, that patient's had three events. And we know that as patients with heart failure live longer, the burden of the disease is often in recurrent non-fatal events. That becomes even more important when we talk about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So it has now become more and more common for us to look at total events, to look at burst and re repeat or recurrent hospital admissions and cardiovascular deaths. And we said that we would do that using this statistical approach, uh, the LYY uh, method. And again, you can see that the, the treatment effect was essentially identical. The emperor reduced investigators used a slightly different approach so that they looked at the two components separately. So they looked at the total number of heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular deaths separately. So here is the same analysis done using their method in, in DAP-HF. And you can see that that effect in heart failure hospitalizations, total heart failure hospitalizations, is very similar to what you see in this uh, graphic that was uh, uh, distributed after the presentation of the trial results. So what else did we look at in both trials? Well, we both looked at the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. We looked at uh, composite renal outcome. We looked at EGFR slope, and we looked at change in natriuretic peptides. So the change in, in uh, Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire was similar in Emperor Reduced. They used a different component of that questionnaire, what's called the clinical summary score. In DAPHF, we use something called the, the total symptom score. But here is the same part of that score uh, in the two trials side by side. And, and effectively, I think the results are the same. The composite renal outcome was interesting. You can see here that there were not many events in either trial, but you can see that there were more events in the emperor reduced trial. So the larger number is in the placebo group. And even though the emperor reduced trial had shorter follow-up, you can see that in the placebo group, there were more renal events. And that almost certainly reflects two things. One is the worse starting renal function on average in patients in emperor reduced and the fact that patients with an EGFR as low as 20 mils per minute were included, but also because the definition of uh, end-stage kidney disease or a, a worsening kidney function was slightly different in two trials. And the most important difference here was that in DAPHF, we required patients to have a 50% or greater decline in EGFR 
to contribute to this composite outcome, whereas it was only a 40% decline in the emperor reduced trial. And of course, more patients will have a 40% decline in EGFR than a 50% decline in the EGFR. So often, uh, strangely enough, little differences in the way that you construct composite endpoints can lead to uh, what some people will perceive to be important differences in the effect of treatment. The EGFR slopes, uh, this is the chronic slope, uh, didn't really differ between the two drugs. So both drugs resulted in a slower rate of decline in EGFR over time compared to placebo. Very interesting finding. And then maybe another, and I think uh, somewhat ignored uh, finding in the two trials was of a rather modest, if any, effect on NT pro BNP. So in DAPHF, we did see a significant reduction in NT pro BNP produced, although there was a greater reduction, 244 picograms per mil compared to 141 picograms per mil. This difference was not statistically significant and M produced. So we had two trials showing that large 25% relative risk reduction in clinical events, but with this very modest effect on NT pro BNP. So this is this is DAP, uh, DAP HF, 303 picograms per mil difference is not a big difference. And in fact, if you look at uh, the correlation between change in natriuretic peptide and reduction in clinical events, actually there's a pretty straight line for most of the trials that we've conducted in the past 30 years in heart failure and you can see here that TAPHF really lies off this line. In other words, the reduction, the hazard ratio below one equates to reduction. The reduction here in heart failure hospitalization over here, all cause mortality, is greater than you might expect for the reduction in NT pro BNP. If I were to put M per reduced, it would be an even more extreme example of this. The, the circle would be up here. So I'm sure this must be telling us something about the way these drugs work because they're not doing what most of the other drugs that we've studied before uh, have done, at least the ones that are effective. So let's come back to the uh, main endpoints in the trial because there was a lot of, I think probably uh, artificial controversy about whether or not there was a difference between the two trials. And that, of course, was because in Emperor Reduced, there was not a statistically significant difference in mortality, whereas in DAPHF, there was a statistically significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality, nominally statistically significant reduction in all cause mortality. So, is this difference real or is it's something else. So let's just look at that in more detail. So again, I'm giving you some insights into how clinical trialists would dissect through the results of trials. So there are probably four uh, possible explanations. And by the way, they're not mutually exclusive. So one might be that empagliflozin isn't as good as dapagliflozin. Another might be that the differences that we saw in the patients might explain why there is no difference in mortality in emperor reduced. In other words, maybe the patients or some of the patients didn't respond to treatment as well. Maybe it's all about statistical power or maybe it's just bad luck because sometimes in trials you get good luck and sometimes you get bad luck. So could it be a difference in the two drugs? I think it's very unlikely. Um, the two molecules, as you can see here, are very, very similar in structure. And it would seem strange that such a small difference could result in a difference in mortality. We do know that we have seen a reduction in mortality 
with empagliflozin in another trial, that was the infrared outcome trial, uh, and we know that we've not seen a reduction in mortality in a dapagliflozin trial, the declared TIMI-58 trial. And by the way, I think this is because of the patients enrolled, and I think this is probably an outlier, and I think this was probably one of those situations where there was some good luck as opposed to bad luck. Um, and But we're pretty certain that, that dapagliflozin, and I believe any SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, can reduce mortality. And this was the very striking result we subsequently got in the DAPA CKD trial. For those of you who, who are not, uh, not familiar with trials outside cardiology, this is the first ever drug shown to reduce mortality in chronic kidney disease. In cardiology, we're rather spoilt and expect to see these sorts of results, uh, but this was a real breakthrough in nephrology. So what about differences in the patients? So I mentioned this requirement to have patients with either a much lower ejection fraction and then reduced or a much higher natriuretic peptide level compared to DAP-HF. It's possible that this might have played a role. So here is what we think is the best way to look at the effect of treatment uh, uh, according to a continuous variable, so like ejection fraction, age, blood pressure. So the, the x-axis here shows you left ventricular ejection fraction. The y-axis is cardiovascular death. This is uh, in, in this panel. This is a hazard ratio. A hazard ratio of one is shown by the horizontal red dotted line. If the hazard ratio is below one, that indicates a benefit of uh, dapagliflozin over placebo. The green horizontal line is a continuous hazard ratio, and the gray shaded area is the 95% confidence interval around the hazard ratio. So of course the hazard ratio, uh, sorry, the 95% confidence interval is quite wide at this lower end of the range because we did not have many patients with an ejection fraction of uh, 12 or 13%. Um, but there was no significant interaction between ejection fraction and the effect of dapagliflozin. Your eye maybe suggests that there might be less effect, but very wide confidence interval and no significant interaction. What about natriuretic peptides? Well, here it's a bit more interesting because what you can see here in this categorical analysis looking at natriuretic peptides by quartile, you can see that there does seem to be certainly a larger benefit in patients who start with a lower natriuretic peptide level. Now, again, this interaction is not statistically significant, although uh, we could argue about uh, what the appropriate p-value is for determining whether or not there's a possible interaction between the baseline variable and the effect of treatment. And some people would regard this as highly suggestive. And again, if you look at this in the same way um, this for the uh, primary endpoint. You can see the continuous hazard ratio shown here in black, 95% confidence intervals in, in gray. The, the red dotted line here is the overall hazard ratio in the, in the trial, 0.74. And again, perhaps the impression that there is more uh, benefit in patients with a lower natriuretic peptide level, but um, again, very wide confidence interval here. So what about whether, is it just a question of statistical power? And here, I think we are on much more solid ground, because if you remember, I mentioned that Emperor Reduced was a much smaller study, 3,000. 700 patients instead of 4,700 patients. That is a very considerable difference in size. I mentioned that it had a shorter follow-up 
And that becomes important because when you look at fatal events, they tend to occur later in follow-up. You accumulate more deaths with longer follow-up than with shorter follow-up. So you're always going to, if you have short follow-up, have a relatively modest number of deaths. But it's very instructive to look at these two trials side by side, because in brackets here, you see the event rate per 100 patient years of follow-up. So you can sort of compare the two trials. And the first thing you can see is that for the composite of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, in emperor reduced, the event rate was much higher, 21 people uh, per 100 person years of follow-up had either cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, uh, and the equivalent rate in DAPHF was only 15 per 100 person years. That is a really big difference. So the strategy that the emperor reduced investigators used to augment event rates by requiring higher natriuretic peptide levels and lower ejection fraction worked very well. It increased the event rate considerably. In fact, it worked so well that the trial completed in a very short period of time, 16 months, as I showed you. But I think this strategy backfired, and this comes back to what I said about sometimes we can be a bit too clever, because what you will see if you look at the next three rows, if you look at heart failure hospitalization, you can see here a greatly augmented event rate in emperor reduced compared to DAPHF, 15.5 per 100 person years versus only 9.8. But if you look at cardiovascular death, there is virtually no difference. So what that strategy of uh, asking for higher natriuretic peptides and lower ejection fraction did was to result in a higher event rate, true, but in a higher rate of heart failure hospitalization and not a higher rate of mortality. So suddenly what you had then was a um, smaller trial with a shorter follow-up and actually not with any more, uh, not, not with a higher uh, cardiovascular uh, death rates, not with a higher overall mortality rates. And in fact, if you look here, you can see that there were uh, 111 fewer deaths, cardiovascular deaths in the emperor reduced trial than in the DAPHF trial. So there was substantially less power to show an effect of treatment. So I suspect that the main reason why these two trials differed in this, uh, these two outcomes is simply lack of power. And that comes back, I think, to the design. So um, I think this is, is probably the, the main uh, reason for that. Now, there are one or two other things maybe worth mentioning. So I've sort of said the first uh, four things in this, but also don't forget the study drug discontinuation rate, because of course, uh, if you have more people stopping active therapy, you cannot show a benefit of treatment. And then that again is going to harm the power of the study. So we've already seen uh, fewer events overall. And then we have this I would say a rather striking difference in study drug discontinuation. So this is also going to have significantly affected the power of the study. So this is another reason I think uh, the trial didn't show a benefit. And then the, the loss of vital status thing I mentioned earlier, that's interesting. Believe it or not, the tipping point uh, for uh, cardiovascular death in this trial is only 22, and uh, the difference uh, uh, 
in, in loss in patients lost to follow up was 20. Uh, so the number of patients lost to follow up was 21. So the trials, um, I think, should be considered together. And I think collectively, they do give a consistent message. And I think, in my own view at least, the difference in cardiovascular death and all cause mortality is probably just about numbers of events. And I'm certainly happy that we've decided to take that perspective in the new guidelines to consider these trials together, to consider the meta-analysis of these trials, and therefore uh, to, to give SGLT2 inhibitors a very strong recommendation. And I just want to say one or two other things. So people always ask about subgroups. I hate doing subgroup analysis, but we're always forced to do it. These are the subgroup analyses that we pre-specified in DAPHF. Immediately you show a subgroup analysis like this. Somebody says, oh, look at patients in class three and four. Uh, they, they did not benefit as much as patients in class two. Well, that's not what this subgroup analysis shows. A lot of people think it's about whether the upper 95% confidence interval crosses the line of unity. It's not. It's about the interaction p-value, and the interaction p-value here is not significant. And you've got to remember that when you do subgroup analyses, these are under powered. If you do enough of them, you will always get a subgroup that appears to be different just through the play of chance. And we can illustrate that very easily in every single trial that we've done. So here's DAPHF. I'm looking at heart failure hospitalization. Here are 12 subgroups. And if you look at subgroup eight, most people, when asked, will say, this subgroup shows that uh, these patients do not benefit from dapagliflozin compared to placebo. In fact, some people might even say that about subgroup 10. That is what you will routinely hear people say when they look at this sort of analysis. But in fact, what these 12 subgroups are, are month of birth. So in fact, group eight here are people who are born in August. And this is just to show that this is completely random. Now, I believe it or not, when I've shown this before, I've actually had people come up to me afterwards and say that they think they know why people born in August don't benefit from SGLT2 inhibitors. But I just shake my head when that happens. I think another thing when you look at clinical trials and you explain clinical trials and when you talk to your colleagues about them, it's always trying to give some sort of context and one of the things that I um, did not realize was that the diabetes world, the, uh, our colleagues, the endocrinology co colleagues who'd done many trials with these drugs before we did use them in heart failure, had not appreciated how different the population that we look after is. So to try and help them understand this, what I did was I put the uh, event rate here. So this is per thousand person years of follow-up, heart failure hospitalization, cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. Here are uh, four of the best known type two diabetes trials with these drugs. And then at the bottom here, you can see DAPHF. And for example, if you take the patients with type 2 diabetes and DAPHF, and you compare them to the patients in the DECLARE TIMI 58 trial, you can see that literally our patients with heart failure who've got type 2 diabetes have a more than tenfold higher event rate than the patients who were studied in these earlier trials. This is really a completely different population much, much higher risk and, of course, much, much larger absolute risk reductions uh, in, in patients with heart failure. And again, another perspective is to look at other types of treatment that we've used in heart failure. And obviously, one of our most recent breakthroughs was in paradigm heart failure, 
and you can see here that um, when you compare the trials side by side, and it's difficult to compare across trials, but to give some sort of general perspective, here are the, the hazard ratios for the same endpoints. And my take home from this is that the benefits we're seeing with an SGLT2 inhibitor are really pretty similar to the benefits we saw with nephrolysin inhibition, although, of course, we know that these are not uh, in competition with each other. These, of course, are to be added together, but it's again, just to give some sort of perspective on the size of benefits. We must do the same when we look at safety. And again, very important to put safety into context and try and understand the meaning of some of the things that we see because often superficially people get the wrong idea. And I'll try and explain what I mean by that in a moment. But by context and thinking about things like ketoacidosis, um, endocrinologists make a big deal of this. Cardiologists sometimes are afraid of this. And again, it's important to put it into perspective. So here are the original three large trials in uh, using an SGLT2 inhibitor, a 1 2 inhibitor in patients with heart failure. Remember, in soloists worsening worsening heart failure, all of these patients had type 2 diabetes. And you can see that there were very, very few episodes of ketoacidosis, two versus four, three versus zero, none at all in emperor reduced. We haven't seen a single case of ketoacidosis in a patient without type two diabetes. And again, to give some perspective in that, uh, on that, I've looked at the risk of angioedema, which we collected very carefully in the Valiant trial, where we compared captopril Valsartan and the combination. And in the Paradigm trial, where there was a concern about nephrolysin inhibition causing angioedema. So again, we collected in a very systematic way episodes of angioedema. And you can see here that the rate of ketoacidosis is no greater and in fact probably less than the risk of angioedema. Again, just to give a perspective on the frequency of this adverse event. And then I said, trying to understand, uh, interpret uh, findings properly, one of the things that, that sometimes causes concern with all of the drugs that we use in heart failure is their effect on kidney function. And with SGLT2 inhibitors in all of the trials, we see a, an early reduction in EGFR. It's usually very small, very importantly, rarely is greater and it's usually less in fact in people who start with a lower EGFR. It partially reverses, but it does not have the same meaning as a spontaneous decline in kidney function over time. And you can show that by looking at the risk of the primary endpoints in DAPHF here in patients who have a greater than 10% decline in EGFR by 14 days versus patients who do not have a greater than 10% decline in EGFR from baseline to 14 days. So if you're in the placebo group and your EGFR falls by more than 10% over the first 14 days after you're randomized, you have a 61% greater risk subsequently of experiencing the primary composite endpoint. On the other hand, if you're in the dapagliflozin group and your EGFR falls by more than 10% in the first 14 days after randomization, your subsequent risk of experiencing the primary composite endpoint is, as you can see here, 27% less. So, this small decline in EGFR early on really has no consequence uh, in, in patients treated with an SGLT2 inhibitor. In fact, it may even be a, an indicator of the favorable pharmacological action of the drug. So again, it's very important to try and understand these changes. 
I had not appreciated that many GPs thought that the reason we didn't give SGLT2 inhibitors to patients with an EGFR below 60 was because of safety concerns about kidney function, whereas of course it was because originally when these drugs were used as glucose lowering therapy, uh, we, we knew that their glucose lowering efficacy declined when the EGFR fell below 60. And that's why in many countries, they were not recommended in patients with type two diabetes when the EGFR was below 60. And quite understandably, many primary care doctors thought that was because of a safety concern instead of a glucose lowering efficacy consideration. So often you have to be very careful and try and understand and explain some of what people believe are safety signals that you see in trials. So I'm gonna finish up about HEFREF and SGLT2 inhibitors to say that there's an awful lot more that we've been learning about these drugs, including um, that they can actually reduce the risk of developing new diabetes, reduce uric acid, reduce the need for uric acid lowering therapies. I'm sure you all know about the fact that they reduce the risk of hyperkalemia. They have some very interesting effects on uh, hemoglobin and anemia, uh, and in fact, reduce the risk of developing new anemia, although we're learning some very interesting things about the effect of these drugs on iron metabolism and it may be that we need to think about using SGLT2 inhibitors in, in conjunction with iron therapy as well. So I'll very quickly speed up now and try and look at the more recent trials. Well, you all know, because this trial was uh, led by Stefan Anker, that there's another large trial in patients with heart failure and an ejection fraction above 40%, and that is the appropriately named for Stefan Emperor Preserved trial. That was the sister trial of Emperor Reduced, much bigger, as you can see here, than Emperor Reduced, reflecting the fact that the event rate in these patients is lower. Uh, I won't go through the design, but again, um, patients with an EGFR as low as 20 mils per minute. These patients, of course, are older. Uh, substantially more of them are women but not more than 50%, because that small group of patients between 40 and 50% are still predominantly male. And that means that uh, the proportion of females is somewhat diluted in a trial that includes patients with an ejection fraction of 40% or above compared to, for example, a trial with an ejection fraction of 50% or above obviously much lower NT pro BNP, and um, um, as you can see here, a substantially lower EGFR. Positive result, once again, 21% relative risk reduction over considerably longer follow-up, 26 compared to 16 months. But of course, in this trial, the benefit driven predominantly by reduction in heart failure hospitalization with no significant effect on mortality. Now again, this is probably a power issue and it is one that affects all trials in patients with an ejection fraction above 40% because if you look at the placebo group here and if you look at the rate of events per 100 person years, you can see that cardiovascular death occurs at a much lower rate than heart failure hospitalization. As you know, overall mortality in these patients is lower than in PEF-REF and the proportion of deaths that are cardiovascular is much lower than in patients with PEF-REF. It's less than half of deaths in these patients are cardiovascular compared to PEF-REF where it's more like a 75 or 80%. And one of the interesting things, unfortunately, we're finding in our ongoing trials in the current era of COVID-19 is of course that there are now even more non-cardiovascular deaths because there is a substantial mortality in trials that are currently running from COVID-19. We're finding that maybe as many as 10% or more of deaths overall 
in uh, heart failure trials are due to COVID-19. Of course, that's reducing the number of deaths that are potentially modifiable by drugs that we believe are beneficial in heart failure, making it even harder to show a difference between active therapy and placebo on cardiovascular mortality. So the same beneficial effect on EGFR over time, same favorable adverse event profile, very, very important in this older, more comorbid group. So no surprises there. There is another very large trial currently running, the DELIVERED trial, uh, again, over 6,000 patients. That's the sister study to DAPHF. Um, this will report early next year. The patients are pretty similar in our two trials. I'm going to read through all of these. You can quickly look down this table, but you won't see many differences. Probably the two things to highlight is that in DELIVER, we uh, tried hard to get uh, patients uh, with a recent hospital admission. We've got about 10% of patients who are enrolled either in hospital or within 30 days of discharge. And we also deliberately included patients with an ejection fraction above 40% who previously had an ejection fraction below 40%, people who we now have to describe as having improved ejection fraction, it used to be called recovered ejection fraction, but the, the nomenclature uh, suggested nomenclature has been changed. So we have a pretty large number of these, this interesting and growing group of patients who have an ejection fraction that has increased substantially with background therapy and uh, we don't know what to do with them. Um, and, and we hope that this subgroup of patients may give us some information. The other thing we hope that our trial will do when we get the results next year is to address this controversy that has arisen following some post hoc analyses of Emperor Preserved, suggesting that treatments that epiglifosin might not work in patients with a relatively normal ejection fraction. Now, um, this is post hoc. This is a relatively small group of patients. I think there are still some big questions about this. There is no significant interaction here. So strictly speaking, it's really hard to say that, that this is different, looks different, but it's not different statistically. So we will obviously add a lot more patients in this group and, and hopefully we can resolve whether or not this is a true finding uh, or, or whether in fact it's just an artifact of relatively small numbers of patients and events in this ejection fraction bucket. So finally, just not to forget about Soloist, this was the trial I mentioned earlier that enrolled hospitalized patients, 1,200 of them, they all had type 2 diabetes, they all had pre-existing confirmed established heart failure. This trial stopped early, as you know, at a very short follow-up period, but I thought pretty convincing benefits. But um, it is still a modest sized trial. It's always good to have more information. And in fact, the Timmy group are running this much larger trial, about twice the size of Soloist. This trial is enrolling patients without type 2 diabetes as well as those with type 2 diabetes. And it's also enrolling patients who present it uh, with new onset heart failure. And very importantly, it's including patients very early after admission, from 24 hours after admission onwards. Soloist, as you know, about half the patients were enrolled after discharge, within three days of discharge, half were started on treatment, study drug, uh, just before discharge, but treatment was not initiated early. Uh, in the next few weeks, you'll see two small studies presented in acute heart failure at the American Heart Association. So, of course, all of this has ignited a lot of discussion about when we should use these drugs, using them much earlier than the traditional approach 
to treating heart failure would suggest the traditional approach has used drugs in the chronological order that we studied them in clinical trials. So starting with an ACE inhibitor, uh, ending up with a mineral and corticoid receptor antagonist. And of course, if we followed that approach, then an SGLT2 inhibitor would come last. And I think there's a lot of reasons to suggest that that might not be the best way to do this. And then I will finish uh, just by saying this is where I think we've got to, but I don't think I probably need to tell many people listening to this presentation about that. Thank you very much. This was an amazing ride through data. And uh, I'm pretty sure we have, uh, Johannes has also a few questions to ask and to discuss. Um, thank you very much for really dissecting um, um, these um, uh, two trials or the SGLT2 um, universe for us. And I hope we have time for a few questions. And for the next like lecture, like it would be really interesting to hear your view about, uh, for example, Paradise MI, Ephesus, Reminder, and, and compare those trials and why um, Paradise um, did not show effects. But um, let's well, start here. Well, I, I, well so I, I would say it did show an effect, uh, but we could we could discuss that. I know you know why it didn't meet its primary endpoint. Yeah. But uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, but um, talking about really what you showed us uh, the difference between um, DAPA HF and and Empire reduced. And talking about the sweet spot when you design a clinical trial where you will um, look for patients that are actually um, sick enough that they well, produce endpoints, so to speak, and um, healthy enough that they um, show the benefit of your um, IMP that um, you want to show. But um, for you and in your clinic, would you say there is a part from kidney function and this gap between 20 and 30 in, in, in each year of R, um, a difference or a patient where you will consider or would consider DAPA, DAPA over EMPA or EMPA over DAPA? No, no not at all. So I, I truthfully don't think there's any difference between the, the two drugs. I myself generally use DAPA glufosin, but that's only because I like to use sort of one drug in a class and get very familiar with it. And um, then I, I know, I understand it when a patient tells me something, it sort of rings a bell. But I'd be perfectly happy for somebody to use empagliflozin. I think it's, it's just, I think the two drugs are essentially the same. I mean, structurally, they're almost identical. And, and I, I don't think, I'm not convinced that I believe in this idea of a sweet spot beyond which you can't help patients. It probably is true in extreme cases, but don't forget trials like Consensus, the original Consensus mm -hmm. trial, those were amazingly sick patients and yet benefit from an allopril. I think it was much more about us making the biggest mistake we continually make when we do trials is not making the trial big enough and then trying to find ways to make the trial finish earlier because that's always the commercial pressure and uh, to get the same number of events. You always need the same target number of events, but if you're gonna get them more quickly and get them in a smaller trial, less expensive trial, then you will do things like try and change the inclusion exclusion criteria to augment the event rates. And I think that can backfire. And uh, I think we've made that mistake over and over again. I made that mistake. Other people have made that mistake. Mm. Um, talking up on the points um, of event rates, um, maybe you can guide us a little bit through the process when designing DAPA. Was it ever like was there the discussion about the endpoint and sticking to um, first event of first event of, of hospitalization and not going for recurrent events that when you look at the data you already you already have on dapa cliflozine that you really want to show an effect on mortality and not have too many events of hospitalizations. So. 
Well, that unfortunately wasn't the case because that DAP EHF was um, another study where we were, I think, lucky. Um, we did not, I could not get enough money from, or AstraZeneca didn't have enough money to spend to do a really big mortality trial. So the trial was powered on the basis of the opposite outcome. When we did Paradigm, the trial was powered on the basis of cardiovascular mortality. So mm -hmm. although the primary endpoint was the same composites, the power, the, the number of events that we continued until we achieved our target number was cardiovascular deaths. So that's a kind of a, a subtle approach when you're designing trials. We, we didn't do that in DAPHF. And we didn't use recurrent events because... Well, first of all, we used that expanded composite endpoint. So we included non-hospitalized worsening events. And again, when you work with industry, understandably, they are always a little bit sensitive to too many changes from usual practice. And the idea that we might make, for example, two changes to the standard endpoints. So the standard endpoints time to first cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, they like changing things too much. And, and they found when we worked with AstraZeneca to design the study, I think they were more comfortable sticking with the time to first event design, but using a broader composite outcome. Um, we have more success in HEF, HEF in thinking about recurrent events because recurrent events adds a lot more in half path than it does in half ref mm. because in a in a relatively short term half ref trial you don't get that many more recurrent events but in half path where the mortality rate's much lower if you're alive and you've got heart failure what's going to happen you're going to get admitted over and over again so the recurrent events approach makes more sense in in half path perhaps than it does in half ref there is one question from the chat before we continue, Hannes. Um, there is uh, Dr. Kovac asks, uh, thank you for the great talk. Are you aware of any RCTs which had a high enough missing outcome rate that the approval of the drug was denied yes. by the uh, regulatory yes. agencies due to the tipping point analysis? Uh, Atlas ACS is probably the best known example. So this was a study with uh, a pixaban in acute coronary syndromes. <laughs> And there were almost as many, uh, or maybe even as many, I can't remember the exact numbers, uh, unknown vital status as there were uh, deaths in the trial. And, and that was just, so the FDA turned, turned that trial down for that reason. Okay. Yeah. Um, and regarding the question Johannes asked and the point you made, um, focusing on the uh, population size, the trial size, um, which is of course, um, related to the event rate, but also related to the endpoint you choose. And uh, would you again choose worsening heart failure as an endpoint? And uh, why did you uh, do so? So this is um, so you're not only having heart failure hospitalization, yeah. but having this uh, addendum yeah. of the worsening. So I, I probably wouldn't because it added a handful like uh, I can't remember 11 or something first additional first events. So it actually made very, very little difference. But the reason we did it was if, if you work in the clinical trial world, which is a global world, uh, some of our trials at 40 or 50 countries, what you repeatedly hear from other places outside Europe is that there's a very strong emphasis, particularly in the US, are not admitting patients to hospital with worsening heart failure. US hospitals, as you know, suffer a financial penalty if, for example, a patient is readmitted uh, soon after discharge. So they have often set up elaborate structures to treat patients in a ambulatory care or non-ward non setting uh, for worsening heart failure so they have special rooms in the hospital where patients can come to get intravenous treatment so it was really to 
reflect the fact that in some places there's there's a change in the healthcare environment to try and limit the number of hospital admissions. Um, and I mean, in principle, it's the right thing to do. In practice, it's made very little difference. In principle, it's the right thing to do because the interesting thing that we found in both DAPHF and in Paradigm is that an episode of worsening heart failure is very bad news. So whether it's in your outpatient clinic or the patient's admitted to hospital, it's got almost the same prognostic significance. So if I see a patient in my clinic and they tell me they're a bit more breathless or their ankles are a bit more swollen and I double their dose of diuretic or I add another drug, if, for example, if they're not on an MRA, I start them on flarenone or whatever, just doing that identifies that as a patient who in the next short period of time, one and a half to two years, is going to have a four, three or four fold higher risk of dying. And that risk in the outpatient is not very different than in the patient admitted to the ward. So what this has sort of led us to understand is the fact that the patient has worsening symptoms and the fact that you as the physician do something about that, that you give the patient, that you intensify the patient's treatment. Those two things are prognostically very powerful. And it's not where the patient is treated. It's the fact that they had worse symptoms and required a therapeutic intervention. That is what identifies that patient as somebody who's going to do badly. So the principle is correct. But in practice, it didn't make that big a difference, probably because, to be honest, we don't often get that many patients from the United States. And this is a much bigger health care issue in the US than it is in Europe. The variance is higher, isn't it? Because, you know, the decision whether the patient in an outpatient um, clinics, whether I should give IV diuretics or not, um, people would have maybe different opinions on that, whether the patient uh, requires a yeah, it, dosage. It's, but very, it's, it's very interesting. One of the things I didn't show you was that we also looked at um, episodes of worsening that were treated with oral therapy, with intensification of oral therapy, so not IV therapy. There were many, many more of those events. They were also prognostically very bad and Uh, the effect of dapagliflozin was identical. The overall relative risk reduction in those worsening outpatient events was 26%. So actually, when you've got big numbers and doctors do things, surprisingly, generally, you can, if you have an effective treatment, you'll pick up that signal. And, uh, and those outpatient episodes of worsening, I think, are very, very interesting. They're, they're prognostically significant. They're very common. They would add a huge amount of power to a trial. But I think the issue will be persuading payers. So we've talked about regulators. Payers are the biggest problem. And, and payers uh, might not find demonstrating uh, that you reduce episodes of, of worsening in the ambulatory care setting. They might, might not find that very convincing in terms of paying for possibly an expensive new therapy. So if you had a composite endpoint where most of the events were worsening outpatient events and very few were cardiovascular death, they might not consider that to be a very impressive result that justified um, you know, the, the cost of the drug. So it's I'm trying to go think about all of these different issues. Yes, I have, a, I have a two questions regarding natriuretic peptides. Um, so is that okay for you to, to go on that topic? Sure. Um, so one question is, so you showed the inclusion criteria of emperor reduced and the different anti-pro BMP levels regarding to the LVF. Do you think that's a valid uh, procedure to do? Um, you know, uh, why would, you know, it's because it's a bit arbitrary to have a five, uh, five LVF points 
and um, to somehow dedicate a certain level of antiprobial to it. Um, that would be question one. And question two, do you think um, that there are surrogate uh, parameters or surrogate endpoints instead of uh, hard endpoints uh, that were picked in these two trials um, for future trials? Um, because uh, I thought that, you know, we have this in half trials, we had that with, uh, with Entresto, uh, which didn't work that good, um, to reduce the level of anti-pro BMP. But uh, you showed uh, these two trials that we see an effect on hard outcomes, but we don't see an effect on anti-pro BMP. Um, so what do you think about surrogate uh, endpoints? So I'll answer your first question first. So I, I, I think that idea of requiring you know different NT pro BNP levels for different ejection fractions is a smart idea, you know, clever idea. It's a great way if you've got a small trial to increase the event rate, but as you can see, it really backfired because all it did was increase the heart failure hospitalization rate. So every trial you learn something from. So that's my takeaway from M produced. I've learned an important lesson about future trial design and heart failure. Um, in terms of surrogate outcomes, I think you're absolutely right. So we have drugs that we know improve ejection fraction. Uh, we have drugs that we know improve six minute walk distance that don't improve or in fact even worsen mortality. So you're too young to remember a drug called Plasequinan, but in my generation, we were scarred by this. I spent a Friday night, one night phoning our patients <laughs> telling them to stop taking and after a large trial called Profile showed that it increased mortality because we've been using it very widely because in those days it had been approved on the basis of, of improving symptoms and improving six mm -hmm. walk distance. So, um, so we've been caught out before and, and you're right, now we're seeing it the other way around here. Here's a drug that has got a very striking morbidity, mortality benefits, but actually had a very modest effect on NT pro BNP. And if we'd studied, if we'd done our traditional phase two development program with SGLT2 inhibitors, we might never have studied them in heart failure because somebody would have said they were very disappointed by the small effect that they had on NT pro BNP. So you cannot replace phase three trials. And to be honest, my advice always to, to pharmaceutical companies is find a dose that, you, that the patient can tolerate. And as long as you know that it engages the targets that it's meant to act on, then try and go straight to phase three because all phase two does, phase two meaning looking at surrogate outcomes is I think create confusion you either get disappointed and, of course, you may throw away a good drug or you think you've got something good only to then be disappointed in phase three, but you spent a long time and a lot of money. Don't forget, in the short patent life of a drug, time is money. So you spend a lot of time and a lot of money doing your cardiac MRI remodeling study, and it really doesn't get you a lot further forward. But on this point, do you think when you have now a drug that discontinuation um, rates are lower than in the placebo arm, that, for example, 15 milligrams per day would be even a better choice? I don't know all the preclinical data. I'm sure you, uh, but is this, is this a point that could be made? I don't think so. Uh, we also talked a lot about dose when we were designing this. Um, so I think actually the, the data with empagliflozin are the most revealing because, as you know, Empireg outcome was actually a trial with three arms. People forget that. So there was a placebo arm. There was a lower dose empagliflozin arm, which is the 10 milligram dose. And then there was a much larger dose empagliflozin arm. And in fact, there was no difference between the two doses. So for empagliflozin, 10 milligrams was top of the dose response curve, if you want to call it that. And um, given that DAPA and EMPA are almost identical chemically, 
I'm pretty sure that 10 is probably the top of the dose response curve for dapagliflozin as well. Before asking a question on the on the meta level, um, you showed the uh, the DAPA trial by the Timmy Group um, investigating uh, the effect of SJC2 inhibitors in de novo heart failure. Uh, so we saw a change in heart failure management in the recent guidelines. So with uh, the the introduction of the four pillars um, of treatment. Um, do you think it's necessary to have a trial which shows that the drug works in a de novo heart failure, not as an um, added uh, therapy? Because with the trials we had, we already are suggesting to start MRAs um, from right from the beginning and not wait um, due to a lot of reasons, but we don't have a trial showing exactly this. Do you think it's a, it's a necessary requirement for future drugs to so show? It's, it's a Fascinating question that you ask because, of course, after Paradigm, one of the many criticisms thrown at us was that we didn't have a study looking at hospitalized patients. We didn't have a study looking at de novo patients. So I feel very sorry for trialists and industry because you do, you know, you, you get criticized no matter what you do. And, uh, you know, uh, again, more data is always good. Uh, do I think we need this? Probably not, because I frankly think that a hospitalized heart failure patient is the same patient. I mean, one day they're, they're walking along the road in Glasgow. Uh, two weeks later, they're breathless and they're in hospital. And a week after that, they're back home walking along the road again. It's the same person. It's the same disease. And I've always got very confused and quite annoyed by my colleagues who want to make a big deal of what they call acute heart failure versus chronic heart failure. I think these are the same patients. So in that sense, I, from my clinical perspective, I agree with you. Um, guidelines can often be very difficult. And we obviously the, didn't know what the ESC guidelines were going to say. So the Timmy study DAPA Act, um, Timmy 58, I think it is, that, that trial was designed before any guidelines came out. And going by the way the guidelines dealt with Sucuptral Valsarsen, we thought that they might say, you know, don't give this type of treatment to people uh, who are hospitalized because we don't have a big trial in non-diabetics admitted to hospital with worsening heart failure. Uh, we don't know about de novo patients because that's the way the guidelines sort of dealt with Sucuptral Valsarsen. So I think the trial was designed for the right reasons. Um, but let's see. I mean, the truth, the, the proof will be whether it manages to successfully complete enrollment. Uh, um, I think that's a... Is there another burning question, Javid? So... <laughs> Okay, I have two, okay? Um, oh. One is, uh, you said you don't like subgroup analyses. Um, and uh, then you showed us uh, some interaction analyses. And uh, for example, you know, one of the um, slides I liked very much was the early dip effect on EGFR. Um, so what kind of analysis, you know, besides the primary and secondary outcomes, do you, um, do you prefer to, to have a look on? And which one would you say it's only a part of the ma marketing strategy? Uh, and uh, the second is, um, we hear, hear a lot about uh, patient report outcome measures. Um, what, do, you know, do you, what do you think about them and how do you include them in, in the study uh, designs and trial designs um, in your mind for future trials? So this, when I'm done. <laughs> so I, I like all analyses, to be honest, uh, subgroup analyses uh, kind of worry me sometimes, not because I think they're inherently bad, they're inherently limited. But the problem is that most people don't understand that. Most people don't even know how to look at those forest plots uh, and interpret them. And for that reason, I think subgroup analyses can be misleading. And um, that's why I made the comment about subgroup analyses. But I do think it's important to understand the effects of treatment. I mean, 
uh, people want to know about should I give this drug to uh, people who are black patients, um, people with and without diabetes. We did that subgroup analysis very prominently because we thought that was important because there was uncertainty whether these drugs would actually work in people who weren't diabetic. So subgroup analysis always will have a role to play, but it's got to be done properly. It's got to be interpreted properly and responsibly. And at least today we're getting better at it. I mean, we pre-specify our subgroups, which is a good thing. Uh, we have a set of rules that tell us about how we should interpret subgroups. And we try in the good journals to increasingly follow those rules so that people don't misinterpret subgroups. Um, and I've forgotten what your second question was. The uh, patient reported outcome measures? Oh yeah. Um, well, again, so this is, this is a really, really interesting issue and I wish somebody could sort it out because basically the problem with these is firstly and, and mostly with the regulators. So they generally don't accept any of these and won't put them in the product label. Uh, and, and then to some extent, the clinical community, because if I show you a two point difference in the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire total symptom score, you scratch your head because you don't know what it means, or you think, well, that looks very small. Well, that doesn't matter. So that's the problem we have. We have these measures that are not really accepted by the regulators and not really understood by the clinical community. And we haven't worked out a good way to interpret and understand and quantify and sort of give a context as to what a two-point change with daffodilflozin means. I mean, I can tell you that it's as big as we've seen with anything, including um, cardiac resynchronization therapy, for example. But, but it's hard to communicate. It's hard to tell people what it, what it means. So I, I think making people feel better is incredibly important. I think trying to stop patients getting worse over time is really, really important. I think these questionnaires are fascinating because what they tell us is that you and I are absolutely hopeless at assessing our patients. Because don't forget, these patients fill in these forms. There are 23 questions. And if you look at the proportion of people between baseline and just eight months of follow-up who tell you that they've got substantially worse, it's a really high proportion. It's 30, 40, even 50%, depending what trial you look at. And we don't ever detect that. We don't, if you look at NYHA class, there's hardly any change. The doctor thinks the patient's doing fine, but the patient who's answering these questions is telling you they're doing worse and it's happening very quickly. And there's a huge disconnect between what we think and what they're telling us. And we're not really looking at that. And it's a whole area that needs a lot more research, but it's hard to get people interested in it. So, we are incredibly thank you for, for your time. And uh, now we have talked, or you have talked us uh, through a whole uh, Glasgow Derby almost. So um, thank you very much. And um, I hope um, uh, Javid and I, we are um, allowed to invite you back um, for our next series. And um, we wish you a nice evening um, in Glasgow from Berlin. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you very much.